Welcome to SEOconspiracy.com. Today, I have the great pleasure to welcome back in the podcast for the last episode of a series, really interesting series, where we went back in time and we traced back the entire history of Google and SEO since the early days, illustrated with his blog post and the one and only Mr. Bill Swalski, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, Bill. Hello. How are you today? I'm very well. I'm uh, pumped for this, uh, this last talk because we will um, talk about the present and about the future. Um, I hope to trick you to come back to SEO conspiracies to, uh, to dig more about diff uh, some other stuff. But I think it's a very, very valuable uh, series that we, we just recorded where we went back in time and uh, throughout your, your work, we were able to trace back all the evolution of Google and how SEO evolved all, also throughout, uh, throughout time. And if you look back now, I hate uh, you hate it when you say uh, when people say you are a legend, but you're part of history. Well, your work, the work you did, is history. It's it's the history of SEO. It's the it's the it's part of the history of our industry, which is only twenty years old. But still, um, you can't say no to that, Bill. <laughs> well, there's a lot more to learn. And Usually when I talk to people, it's about the future of SEO rather than the past of SEO. True that, true that. Uh, you symbolized you symbolized very well the mindset of adapt or die and to have the vision to see what other people don't see. We've talked last time about how since 2005, you already saw this semantic SEO trend before it even existed. Yeah. By by reading uh, scientific papers like the topic sensitive pedring and so on. Adapt or die. It's a little bit more violent than the way you say it. That's my style. <laughs> but same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. And the fact that we are still standing. If you started, we started uh, around the same time, uh, early 2000, and we are still standing today, that means something. It really does, because it changed so much. I mean, do you, do you remember where we come from? I mean, that's crazy. Title tags and backlinks with anchor links to what it is today, it's pretty insane. There's some things that just don't change though. They stay the same year after year after year. Knowing, true. knowing who your audiences are is important for any SEO campaign, any marketing campaign. You have to know what you, who the people are who you're creating things for. And that's regardless of what technology is in place. Intent is the key concept that people should focus on. Because if you get that, and can you, can you tell us again the oh, warning? He's cheating. Because... <laughs> I will ask him to, to explain to us again the example back then when you just started about, uh, about uh, a law firm. But it was a little bit easier for him to understand intent because he did, you did study law, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the part of the story that I know, but you don't tell that during a <laughs> podcast or, or public talks. But I know, I know, I know my bill. I know my... <laughs> I've, st I've studied you, so I know where you are. But it is, first question. Uh, first, yes, please tell us how you, you started this, um, this first exploration of the intent throughout the, this, this first case. How I started intent, how I, in an SEO campaign? When you worked with the, the law firm, right? Right. And uh, you already, and again, back in the context, that was like, what, 2005, something like that? 2000? Yeah. 
uh, but you already I remember in the, in the previous episodes you 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 explain how already back then you were already thinking about intent and already trying to put yourself in the shoes of the person looking for a service and you already started to build back then you wanted to to rank on law firm San Diego, you repeat law firm San Diego 200 times on the page and you put all your anchor text on your backlinks, law firm San Diego. Bill Swalski here, ladies and gentlemen, what did he do? He built an entire guide. He already <laughs> tried to find semantic affinities when Google did, didn't even have a clue of what, what that meant. <laughs> you remember that story? I remember a lot of stories like it. Uh, I, I was talking about Baltimore.org and, and how we were trying to rank for Black History Baltimore. And oh, yeah, decided, that was it. Yeah, that's we, right. We decided that it was almost impossible because there were too many competitors who had good websites who, who had that phrase covered. And trying to rank for matching strings, matching Black History Baltimore was was not the way to go there there was too much actual history in the city that we could describe that people would search for and you may refer to them as long tail terms at this point i sort of thought of them as those when i wrote about it but uh talking about people like uh, uh billy holiday or frederick douglas when when talking about baltimore made sense uh these were people that people would look for. They were interested in finding out more about what their involvement in Baltimore was. Uh, the famous churches, the uh, uh, people like Sojourner Truth, who was involved in churches in Baltimore in the early 1900s. People, people searched for her. Uh, that, that didn't sound like new technology. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a uh, notification that pops up on a Windows computer in the same little tiny space that uh, lots of programs want you to also type in at the same time. Yeah, but what was it, like Windows 95? Or <laughs> it sounded like Windows 95. <laughs> it's, it's the most up-to-date version of Windows 10, but it works like Windows 95. <laughs> but to, to, to go back on Baltimore, what... what right. What's very interesting is how you, okay, you say, fine, we are this entity, uh, but we need to balance out. We need to strengthen, to be stronger on, on the other part, because right. to be relevant on both, something Baltimore, well, okay, you are doing a service or selling a product in Baltimore, and that will be easy uh, to identify you as a relevant entity about that. Uh, but then the city itself, if you just repeat Baltimore all over the place, that's not enough to be relevant. So, so the move had to come. We were no longer just trying to rank well for the string, Black History Baltimore. We were trying to rank for the concept, for mm. all the related meanings, all the, mm. uh, the idea that people were interested in people and places in Baltimore and the history of Baltimore. So if we included entities that were involved mm -hmm. in building that history, we ended up ranking for that term. Uh, it, it made sense. Let people mm -hmm. search for uh, uh, UB Blake or, or, or mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass, and, and the page would rank for Black History in Baltimore because it was about the history of Baltimore that, that people were interested in. Uh, the other example I would jump on before we move forward to the present is uh, the example you always mention when you need to be relevant, you need to understand intent, and uh, a trend that people have today is you want to order pizza for lunch and People will rank with the history of pizza because there's a lot of work and they're optimized. Um, that's what's happening now <laughs> because what you did back then was the truth. We didn't, you were one of the only one, one of the first ones to do it. Now everybody is doing it, but doing it wrong, in my opinion. 
and there are there are ways of Google's looking at intent that are differently now than they did 10, 15 years ago. They're, they're talking mm -hmm. about queries as if they were canonical queries. And mm -hmm. Google has a query log where they can look at what people search for. And they can see how often people search for information about certain subjects and what words they use, what questions they actually type in. And we see things like people also ask questions in search results, and those are the types of queries that people are actually searching with these days. So if you're interested in a topic and you search for information about it, and you see people also ask questions, you can get a sense of what canonical queries are for that topic by what questions they're showing. Uh, so when you search for pizza 10 years ago or even today, you and, and it's lunchtime, you must li likely want to order a slice of pizza. You don't care about who invented pizza, uh, all the differences in menus of pizzerias over the year, what the first pizzeria was in New York City. It's not really what you're interested in. You want lunch. Uh, I, I never search in, in English, but in French, it's laughable, the, the query, uh, SEO consultant, <laughs> because they all, they all do like SEO guide and explain uh, everything. <laughs> uh, well, it's better, let's face it, let's move forward to today. It's, yeah. it's better than it used to be. The, even the low quality content um, and the trend now, you probably saw OpenAI, GPT-3, the whole buzz, blah, blah, machine can write like a human being. Uh, no, not yet. Not for long form content, at least, I don't believe. For short form uh, uh, results of, uh, of uh, sports, elections, um, all that stuff, yeah, a machine can do it. But, but I don't know what's your opinion. We will go into machine learning in a second, but about the... I'm using uh, GPT-2 and the whole buzz around GPT-3 is a little bit annoying in my opinion because they, uh, it's just an evolution. It's not a revolution. Let's not get over our head, guys. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yes, to, um, to not digress, to stay focused here because we have a lot to cover. Many things didn't change. It's still the same mindset. You were lucky. You put yourself in a good position. You read the. You had. You took the right path to try to learn by studying pattern, whatever is also behind the pattern. Because what people see on your blog post is just the result, just the formatted text. And we spoke about this. We like to explore scientific documents even more than the pattern itself. And mm -hmm. the, the profiling of the authors also is very important. Um, so you were lucky to see that uh, from the start. Now it's a semantic as you always the way to do. And then uh, it's for the better. Even from technical SEO, it's all better. It's still spam. Um, Supposedly, Google improved in fighting spam. Panda, Penguin, 90% um, of Black Hat is dead. Uh, and psychology for, psychological warfare also worked. Propa Google, propag I, I just saw the, the green report, right? Coming out by Google. Come on. Google is not saving the world, right? It's not doing any good for the planet. <laughs> what are you pretending? Like it's like remember those Apple keynotes where they have the the ecological uh, status of a, or recycling part of a mag of a computer. You can't throw a computer in the trash. Like it, it's it's so. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway. Uh, some pretend, yeah, trying to, to save the world, but whatever. The point is that today you wanted to discuss about how your way of exploring algorithms, pattern, how does Google work is based on common sense, experience, learning a lot, and not having an end game. You don't know where you are going, what you want to look for, and if you ever will find something. Then 
we have some other people. And let me share a tweet. By yourself uh, on July 16th. If you think SEO correlation studies may be useful, you should stop that and read this. This article shows how SEO studies that claim how to decode Google and other search engine algorithms are based on poor data and bad science. Uh, it's an article about Jeff Ferguson. Jeff Ferguson? But we don't need to, um, I'll, I'll give the link, people can, can read it, it's interesting. Let's start with bad science. Okay. Can you please tell us what does that mean, bad science? What that means is performing a study that looks at lots and lots of data and finding correlations uh, about that data, uh, like pages that are longer than 3,000 words tend to be in the first page of Google and saying, oh, that, that must mean that Google likes ranking wrong pages highly. We don't know that. We know that there's uh, a likelihood that a long page will show up in the first page of Google by looking at all that data. There's also a lot of uh, shorter pages and you have rounding errors. You have uh, short pages ranking too, but some long pages are longer than that. So you're, you're not making any definite statements. You're not showing any causation. You're not showing any reason why a longer page would rank higher. You're just showing us the uh, uh, correlation, the, the, the fact that a lot of pages that rank highly are that long. And the I think the ultimate flow in that is people believe that it becomes a standard that by writing 3,000, I think it's 2,000 words, right? That they came out with, but or whatever, two or 3,000, right. doesn't matter. That if you write 3,000 words, then you have more chances to rank on the first page of Google. Uh, doesn't make any sense, none. In the same, the same study says something like, uh, if your URLs are shorter than uh, 10 characters or 20 characters, you also tend to rank on the first page of Google. So that, that tells people they should be editing the length of their URLs if they're shorter to get them to rank higher. Mm. It's not true. That your, your Pages don't rank highly based on the length of your URL. They rank highly based upon your content, based upon links to your content, and based on other factors. And, and the length of your URL is, is a rather minimal or, or uh, actual non-ranking mm. signal. It, it has nothing to do with how your page ranks. Just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's a causation, right? Exactly. Uh, and the issue with that is it was fun at the beginning because we had to figure out, okay, we started from nothing. So, so we had to understand um, what to optimize, where, where, what were the, the stronger uh, assets, you know, let's call let's call them that instead of ranking factors. Okay, we have assets, uh, we have backlinks, we have title tags, we have content, we have internal links, we have all those assets, and how do we use them? That's how I saw it, and we try to to make our, our source to say, okay, we need to optimize this, uh, and the difficulty is you need to push hard enough to seduce the algorithms, but stay below the statistical anomaly, you know, not push too hard. Uh, the exact match domain is, I saw uh, last week John Mueller stating something this, that in my opinion is totally wrong. If you use wisely an exact match domain, it works wonderful, but people are pushing too hard, so they get flagged so easily because it's already, uh, you, have a, you have an exact match domain, don't treat it like a like a porcelain uh, vase, you know, don't don't <laughs> don't optimize like a like a pig. 
So one of the very first forums that I went across after I decided many years ago that I wanted to do SEO was one where there was an argument going on about what the perfect keyword density was for a certain term within a certain niche industry. And it was, it was ridiculous at that point even, thinking that Google was using keyword density percentages uh, that were different based upon different industries. My and, channel and is people, called. The people so, arguing so, were very yeah. serious about it. True, true. I remember that. And that's why I created this channel, SEO Conspiracies, because the list is endless of those things that were born out of air, out of someone just. And if it's someone influent in the industry, everybody will, will follow <laughs> whatever that person says. So we do have a responsibility. And myself, I claim that sometimes I do troll a little bit, trying to, to see if people will follow or not. Uh, and um, it's all good fun. But that was the early days. Now, today, what's happening is with those uh, heavy uh, CPU, uh, like computers, uh, very cap capable of, of crushing data, uh, crunching data and and those algorithms of machine learning or whatever you want to call it that you can find everywhere for free well everybody's coming out with a study and it's only clickbait it's only for cloud it's only to get something it's not to make the industry move forward like your work it's only to get something back in return, which is tweet, retweets, likes, blinks, whatever they want. Um, and, and enough is enough. Uh, I think you're right to point this out because uh, in 2020, it does not make any sense to, um, I would I say to 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 follow the, the those studies. So first question was about bad science, and yeah. it will make us lead into the next uh, chapter of the, our discussion. Because the the second part of this article is uh, hold on, I'm lost here. Long history of bad science uh, statistics. The last second part was was the research presented is limited and unverified domain authority for example that's one of my pet peeves yeah it doesn't mean that google doesn't have something that wants to understand signals linked to authority or trust or whatever but a domain authority score from an SEO tool is nothing less than a witch uh, magic trick. <laughs> uh, it's not based on anything relevant. And There are domains that have always consisted of more than one website, like a GeoCities mm -hmm. or WordPress.com or Blogspot. So Google isn't ranking those domains or those sites on those domains on the basis of a domain authority score. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Google sees the web URL by, by URL, page by page anyway. So the page rank algorithm is, is, even though it's named after Lawrence page, it's based on rankings on, of the pages. <laughs> so pages are linked together under the same roof, there's a home page, which is usually stronger than the others. But what I hate is this market, marketing, marketing around those tools about this domain authority score build up out of, I don't know what. So there's a context to domain authority. Domain authority, the one that was published by Moz, was intended as a way to estimate the value of getting a link from a specific domain versus getting mm. a link from a different domain. So you could take those domain authority scores and based on those, try to guess which was a better source of links for your domain. And that was the sole purpose behind domain authority. 
there was never uh, a belief that uh, Google used domain authority the way Moz came up with one. Mm, maybe in the early days, but um, I and read... That was, that, that was how Mo the reason why mm. Moz came up with that score. People may have written a lot of stuff about domain authority now and uh, they're most likely wrong in most cases. Uh, we know PageRank. We know topic-sensitive PageRank. Right. Those are documented. You can see them even today. Majestic.com citation flow is the PageRank formula, and uh, the trust flow is the topic-sensitive uh, PageRank formula. That's what it's worth. That's what I mean. That's what it is. Okay. It's yes. maybe not a miracle, but at least it's documented. It's real. Uh, they did a lot of. Uh, correlation studies they didn't you didn't see them publish anything about saying oh we found them I know because uh, I know very well Dixon Jones so he shared with me those studies but in private not in public you know it didn't they didn't yeah. say we have the magic formula for the page rank they say hey, we did a lot of tests and it looks pretty close but that's the difference between saying, okay, we reproduced the, the page rank formula we did a lot of tests looks pretty close from as far as we can see or are trying to to build your entire branding around around this uh, and a score that is um, the way they they build the score is uh, is mysterious. They don't they are not open about it. Yeah. So how do we know? You know, you remember that tool Clout.com that was putting a, a page rank on people. You don't remember that tool for a little while. It was analyzing your uh, your Facebook, your Twitter, and your LinkedIn, I believe, and it was putting a page right. rank on people's uh, face, <laughs> a score of uh, 100. A personal, a personal page rank in cloud score. Cloud, yeah, cloud, K-L-O-U-T. I think it got sold, but uh, it reminds me of that. You know, you, you, you do like, a, it's reverse engineering uh, algorithms and then putting together a score to uh it was a social media connector score yeah 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 so uh so it doesn't like i said of course they are google is trying to analyze <laughs> uh authority and analyze uh, trust and figure all this out but i i, I don't trust that these guys reversed engineered um, the algorithm because even from a scientific process point of view the way they're doing it most of the others because most is not the only one uh, doesn't make sense to me. One, of, one of the problems that tool makers will run into increasingly in the future is google is caring less about these types of metrics page rank and, and so on they're they're actually moving on to other ways of measuring things using machine learning here you go so you are moving on to the next topic now of our discussion i think it's a good time to move. yeah ranking those ranking factor studies and all this crap forget yeah. about it because it's not relevant today please tell us why so one of the things that Google is likely doing at this point, or at least exploring deeply, and they've patented it, is the concept of author vectors. And, and they can uh, look at a page and get a sense of who the author of that page might be. I mean, they've been studying uh, writing styles and, and the way people create content for years. They have uh, a corpus of uh, scanned books that they can do studies on. Uh, and, and, you know, millions of books written by millions of authors. Uh, they have a lot of data an to analyze. They can uh, break text down into n-grams, short bursts of, of content, one through, say, five characters long, and, and create statistics about those n-grams that tell them tendencies that writers follow when they write something. And, and they can identify uh, authors by what they write about and uh, what statistically what they've created in the past. 
they, they can tell the uh, idiosyncrasies of specific authors. And they can identify uh, quite possibly who's written what based upon that content. Uh, it's, it's a point where they're, they're no longer relying upon the string of text that identifies somebody's name in a byline. They're, they're actually looking at the content and saying, this follows the uh, way that so-and-so writes. Uh, it's most likely from them. Mm -hmm. Even though some, some authors can write differently on different platforms. Uh, and, and some people are ghostwriters. They exactly. tend to somebody else. Um, but moreover, it's the fact that these um it, it's it's interesting because in fact what you're saying it's the coin it's the same thing but different it's like the the, the other face of the coin the way we s google is is working now uh is the same but different it's really like flipped over so even if those ranking factors might still have some value and backlinks are not going away, title get tag value is not going away. But because of machine learning, because of the way it's trying to even going back to this, to this intent and trying to be very precise um, and have basically wish instead of doing broad SEO strategies, it should be query by query on a macro. I would confuse micro, micro, macro is close, right? <laughs> macro so, is a big scale. Micro is a small. Yeah, macro is uh, is the small. So, so at least for your important keywords, maybe not all of them. Yeah. And then Pareto principle says that twenty percent will make eighty percent, and I will uh, even still think that five percent of your pages will do most of the job. Five percent of your pages you need to take care of them one by one because having those general statements about SEO might be the foundation, but is not the solution. The end game here is trying to very fine tune what signal you send according to what in intent you want to answer and the environment around you. What does Google want future versus what does Google have past and present? Do I have a, am I presenting it okay? Google has written a number of things over the years about authors and about authorship and reputation scores for those authors. Now, I didn't talk about this much in this authorship uh, vector post. I did mention some of them like agent rank, which I wrote about in 2007. And in that one, Google said, we may look at content people create and content that people edit and comments that they write on content. And we may give content on pages scores based upon editors, authors, commenters. Uh, and, and those are reputation scores based upon those people and what else they've written on the web. Uh, so there's an idea that Google could rank based upon rank things based upon what somebody's written uh, in the past and what they're written, what they've written now. Maybe how reliable they are, how uh, popular they are, uh, what else they've written about, and, and how people respond to them. Uh, so there's there's a potential for those types of reputation scores based upon who the author or something might be. Mm. Uh, which is a different way of ranking things. And, and it's something that Google could use in a machine learning approach to rank content on the web and, and to present diversity in search results. We want content from different people. We don't want the same, uh, same author showing all the results for certain subjects. Uh, if, if, they, if they can determine mm -hmm. things like EAT scores, expertise, authority, and trust, if they can determine that somebody's an expert on the subject, they can say, let's show uh, content from this person for this query because they're an expert on the topic. Do you think people 
should um, not be afraid to build themselves as a brand to uh, it's totally doable i mean you became we all became something an entity you can see it in easier way to see it is google trends do you exist in google trends or not is already a first sign of uh, do you have an existence I, I, <laughs> I encourage people to build a personal brand to develop an expertise in certain subjects to show off that expertise uh, I think it's it's worth doing as an SEO, as a professional, as as a, any type, you know, as a teacher. Because as... before Google, Patton, Bill, Solsky were yeah. not associated together. You did the work that today you are related to Google Patents for everything you did and everything that all the signal around your work um, you created this relation this this vector um, and, and you became uh, so the people are very impatient now and uh, they say yeah but you guys started like 15 years ago yeah but you don't need you have to start okay you have to start somewhere maybe you won't need 15 years to, to build something <laughs> uh, so so Yes, uh, one of, did it happen to you? Okay, uh, it was last week. Yeah. Not a client, uh, is now a client, a sign, but comes up and says, hey, uh, this website is out, out ranking me and look at his backlinks, look at his content, I'm better, you know, the, the famous theory, everybody above me is a spammer, kind of. <laughs> Spam, sites positioned above yeah. mine. So, Without even knowing the result, I, I did it live, but I knew, the, I knew what I was going to find. I opened up Google Trends, I compared both websites. Well, the one who was outranking was building a brand. So it was really like a steep curve of, of uh, the proof that the brand was alive and that people were searching for that brand. And the, my client now was just a flat line at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and I see more and more and more of these examples of people looking at basic SEOs, SEO KPI, and not looking at that branding factor that becomes maybe that might be the decisive factor um, if at equal value. And <clears throat> even if you don't pretend to become an author like like Bill Swalsky or Shakespeare or whatever. To exist, to be born, to to have that digital footprint, in my opinion, is, is increasingly important because, like you said, now Google is shifting how it's doing things and the importance of how machine learning, uh, like you explain, who is relevant for what and when. Everybody needs to be at the right place at the right time and that's the way the machine works. I mean, that's mach maybe you will explain it better than me, but classification, the way machine, there is no maybe, okay? <laughs> there is no maybe for, for, for Rank Brain and all. So we were talking about this, and I, I mentioned to you there's another patent similar to the author vector patent, which is a speaker vector patent. And there's all kinds of audio on the web, podcasts. Uh, hangouts, other things where, where Google can listen and analyze audio. Videos you know, from YouTube, there, there's so many YouTube videos are uploaded every minute of every day. Uh, Google has all kinds of data they can experiment with. They can study. They can uh, listen to people talk and analyze. Uh, get some sense of what they're doing. Uh, and People I've, I've talked to have been saying that they've, they've seen uh, transcriptions from videos uh, have gotten much better over the past few years. I think Google is spending a lot of time with videos. We're trying to make sure they can understand what people are saying and, and get a better sense of, of who they are. Uh, the author, the speaker vector patent is like the author vector patent, except Google is trying to understand 
who the people are who are speaking, what they're talking about, what subjects they're talking about, what information is associated with them, where they're mm. from, whether or not they have an accent, uh, other, other things like that. Uh, what pers personal idiosyncrasies that they might have when they talk. Uh, and and that's those are signals that Google is now looking at that, again, have nothing to do with uh, the length of a title or what the uh, anchor text and, uh, mm -hmm. the link might be or so on. But it's a, it's a different way of analyzing content on the web. And this is something that isn't associated with, with a traditional 200 ranking signals type thing from Google, but it's a movement that Google's taking. They're, they're analyzing different things. They're trying to understand, okay, who are the best podcasters? Who are the people most listen to? Who are they? Can we understand uh, what the voice sounds like, what they say? And can we understand them when we see them, when we hear them on something else, like the podcast is a guest? Can we tell it's them? And what do they talk about there? Let's build a database of all this information about these individual mm -hmm. speakers. Let's treat them as if they're specific entities. Voice has a, a whole set of new challenges because of nuance, because of all that. Um, you know where Google should go for information on that? What's that? YouTube. <laughs> they're neighbors. They, 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 they are, they're owned by Google, but they will never speak. It's crazy. The subtitles... Oh. So there is one, at least one white paper from Google on a topic they refer to as prosody. Is that prosody, prosody is studying pauses, studying emphasis when people emphasize something when okay. they talk, when they pause, when they uh, uh, just how they say what they say, and and. That's something that Google analyzed when they came out during this uh, Google Developer Series, when they came out with the uh, examples of uh, Google using artificial intelligence to call businesses to like make reservations at hotels or restaurants. And they people who they called had no idea they were talking to a machine because it did things like it paused and it, it uh, uh, used uh, or, uh, hmm. or, or other words that aren't normally just words, they're more sounds that people make, and the machine was doing that. So the people they talked to didn't understand it was a computer. Uh, but Google's been learning from listening to people. Why did I say YouTube? Because the, um, uh, the subtitles, so if you edit manually your subtitles uh, like what i do with seo conspiracy it's yeah. english subtitles you start correcting them and very quickly like takes four or five videos google yeah. uh google youtube is improving so fast and learning so fast how you speak adapting it's incredible it's the best speech to text technology i know the youtube uh subtitles I think in an earlier uh, presentation, I mentioned a patent from Google where they talked about code searching and how they yes. are using knowledge bases to identify the sources of codes. And they stopped doing that. They updated the patent that was based on. They said, we're going to analyze audio from videos and we're going to look for quotes in that audio because they, they came, mm -hmm. and they didn't say this in the patent, but it's most likely because the intent behind that search, who said what quote, was most likely to watch that person saying that. So they want to show them the video. It's a talk I did yesterday in French. Uh, not a talk. Um, we don't do keynotes now. We do, <laughs> we do virtual stuff. But, but it was about SEO in 2020 versus 2010. And, yeah. and, and I'm like, guys, text, image, video, audio, four formats. It's in the search engine, search engine result page, it's in the mobile device. People are consuming content in this four format, those four format of content. 
until the end of the world, it will be text, image, video, audio. You have to do multimedia today. Think about SEO in a multimedia uh, way. A text is, uh, I'm not saying text is dead, okay? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but especially on the mobile, people consume a lot of images and sound and, uh, and video. Why, well, why don't... We have, um, we have video, we've got podcasts, which are both growing at tremendous rates. Podcasts uh, are becoming bigger than television. Uh, an alternative, not bigger. Television is still big, but a, a really serious alternative to uh, to television. I'm listening to lots of audio books, and, mm -hmm. and the thought came on my, my mind, uh, why don't I listen to plays like people like Shakespeare? Because it'd be fun to listen to those. I don't know about you, but I got a little bit excited too early about voice search. A little bit too excited. I thought... Uh, uh, it was uh, yeah, Alexa was coming out and then uh, Google Assistant, all that. Google Now, do you remember Google Now? It was also uh, trying predictive search and all yeah. that. Um, and Apple search engine, you heard the rumor, in my opinion, it's a f only a feature for Siri, for Spotlight. It's not going to be a yeah, what do you think about that? Do you think it uh, Google, I, Apple? I, I think that Apple's foundation for search is very different from Google's and it's very different from Yahoo's. You remember Yahoo came to search and they were originally a portal. So they always had lots of noisy stuff on their homepage, lots of news and mm. links to fantasy sports and uh, personals and things like that. And it was really busy. Google said that plain sparse sparse homepage with search box and the word Google at the top, and they had to put copyright on the page so people knew it was an end to the page. Uh, but but they've been adding more stuff to that recently. They've always uh, been based on search. Siri, uh, there was a Siri company that Apple acquired, and they acquired the technology for Siri. And the patent for Siri talks about active ontologies. Uh, so with certain topics like restaurants, there are always things that people ask about, like making reservations mm -hmm. or seeing recipes or menus, things like that. So they understand what types of things go with restaurants. They understand the ontologies, the words that are related to topics that are related with commerce, the same type of things. With travel, you know, hotel, booking hotels, booking up flights. Uh, they understand there's a whole set of tasks that go with those types of things. Interesting. And these are the roots of Siri. And Siri is a search, but it's a search based upon understanding how things are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very like you said, very different approach than, than Google because it's to serve an ecosystem uh, and not trying to organize the world's information and, and uh, <laughs> the, the way Google approach it. So it's going it's, from from the the need. What do people need throughout the features, Siri or Spotlight and the written word and serving? Uh, because right now, Siri is amazing to interact with the device but it sucks yeah. when you, you try to get out of the device and that's something that comes from the outside world, outside of, uh, of uh, the Apple ecosystem. So that's, I think that's where they're going. But uh, staying on this future of search, multimedia becomes obvious right now. But also you've been... Nobody talks about Bill Swalski, the agency, uh, GoFish Digital, and what you do. It's a fair statement that, and you've been doing that for a long time. You build yeah. a very strong SEO layer based on these all principles of semantic and topical clustering and all that. But it's not it. Around SEO, you do everything content marketing, basically. Uh, to to uh, to make sure that not only the SEO layer is giving enough power, 
doing everything around SEO makes SEO work, but also yeah. uh, I like to call it the three thirds, building a brand, referrers, and organic traffic. Um, is that the first statement to um, summarize your, your work? I think that's fair statement. I, I think I've uh, created a personal brand and I've created a, a business brand. I think uh, Bluefish Digital is known for being strong this year. We get lots of referrals from existing clients for new mm. business, uh, or uh, business from people who uh, know our customers uh, one way or another and refer us. Oh, your, your agency is, is very well known. It's very strong. Even within the industry, you, you are definitely uh, one of the top notch. But what I wanted to say is when you are interviewed, when people want you, it's always about patents. <laughs> <laughs> you are Mr. Google Patents. And um, I think there's a lot more to, to Bill Swalski than just uh, Google Patents and, and the way I said that last time, but I will say it again because it's important. You could have taken advantage of your knowledge for fame, for money, for whatever. You could have done uh, things that, uh, and that's why I think we relate because we rather chill, okay? <laughs> we rather like, we have enough. We don't need more. We don't need more power. We don't need more fame. We don't need more money. We, we're we good. We're good. Uh, and uh, so, so one of the things I say about patents I like to learn about from them is mm -hmm. the search engineers who write them provide their assumptions about search, about search engines, and about searchers to us. So it's not just the technology they're writing about, it's how they feel about the world around them. Exactly. And I think that's interesting, uh, seeing the evolution of, of how they treat searchers, how they feel about search, mm -hmm. how, how uh, we've gone through a growth of uh, the mobile web and some of the early uh, patents on phones have to do with uh, uh, how many times do you have to press certain letters on a keyboard to get numbers? Like you have to press the letter mm -hmm. A four times to get the number nine. You know, and, and they patented that. And they're patent, patenting stuff like that. Wow. Uh, till, till we get, and that's a uh, uh, text entry uh, representation. Uh, and, and we get to the time of Siri mm -hmm. where they're talking about those active ontologies, which is a very move, change around how many times you uh, might press certain letters. Uh, it's interesting it's, how, how even our, our talk was overlapping when I was fish, finishing up uh, on the ranking factor studies and, and yeah. talking about the switch, and you were already on the author vectors because yeah. that's it. That's really it. Um, the level of profiling and the level of, uh, maybe that will change after the DOJ report, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> but as, uh, as of today, the level of, even from a ads perspective, I think Larry Page uh, a couple of years ago said something like, today we're able to serve ads more relevant than organic search. Uh, and I believe that statement for for sure, but yeah. but don't you think? Let's imagine the future. Uh, they will nail DOJ uh, big tech hearing. They will all turn bad. Privacy is a trend that's not going backwards. Talking about Apple, uh, it's closing up the ecosystem, and more and more people will bet on privacy. I don't know if you came across this article by a Dutch uh, media broadcaster who went back to the old way, targeting the content, meaning that they, they, advertise, they put the advertisement in relation with the content, like AdSense would do, you know? Regardless, uh, they forgot the, 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 the profiling from the user, like everybody else is doing, and they just did it like we used to, saying, okay, we have a piece of content about topic A, 
let's find an advertiser in relation with topic A. And they more than doubled, uh, I think it was 65% uh, increase in revenue. What, what is your thought about privacy? And remember, it was the end of the world when the not provided. <laughs> we thought everything was over. <laughs> if the search engine provides you information that's personal to you, but doesn't provide that personal information to anybody else in the world ever. Oh, that's it's, that's it's a, it's a it's a value to you. Uh, you're talking about new Google feature. I forgot what's his name. Um, um, there 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 are multiple ways of doing that. There's a new patent that came out last week that said we might look at uh, information about a searcher and a document that they've recently seen in our search results, like a, a, a slide information. I, to a certain place. Yeah, I covered it. I, I covered it in my uh, SEO conspiracy news. It came out like very recently. It's it's with the Google Discover trend, but but shopping style. Um, and that's it. So you are saying, okay, and do people? Do people? It doesn't seem like people care. They are, they are okay with the transaction. Okay, it's free. You want my data, but I've, whatever. So there's doesn't one. There's one that talks about a, a personalized entity repository, where it says Google may learn about things that you're interested in or things that you're involved with. Say you're taking a flight to New York, so it might pull up a. a uh, knowledge base on your phone about places to go to in New York because you're going there. Okay, I found the pattern. And, and you'll and you'll search for it. This is the pattern, oh, but you can't see it well. I don't know what's wrong with the. Okay, let me stretch back this up. But having having that information at your fingertips in case you do search for it and an answer. Uh, on your phone in, the, in a database on your phone means you don't have to wait for Google to search some server to provide the information. They can just provide it to you right away. So if you're going to New York City and you want to go to restaurants, you do a query on your phone for restaurants in New York City and it can return that information right away to you. It doesn't have to uh, send the signal out to some through some uh, cell tower and pass it back to you it's already on your phone that's the way um some i i, I forgot the technology it's uh, it's not ghost it's not phantom it's uh i forgot there's a technology indeed that leaves all the private data on your phone and nothing goes up to the cloud and uh, I strongly believe that's the way to do it. But data is power. So now, if you are in the spot of all these data-hungry companies, um, how would they do it if if they leave the the good stuff on the on the device and don't they don't um, get back any of it? They have to show to everybody all the time that they're not going to compromise that data. They're not going to sell it off to somebody else. They're, it's your private data. They're going to keep it mm -hmm. private, and they're not mm -hmm. going to give it to anybody else other than you. Mm -hmm. Same thing with uh, like Google's based on location history. So you you uh, Google Maps, you use it to navigate from place to place. They keep track of where you go. They sometimes will ask you to update your timeline of where you've been. So they have a good idea of where the places you travel to are. Uh, in addition to location history, which is real world physical location history, they keep records of your search history. So where you go on the web is another thing that they track. Uh, another set of patents they talked about they haven't incorporated into actual real life yet as far as I'm aware but they might is media consumption history and they'll keep track of music that you listen to and I know my phone does this now it identifies songs that are playing in the background on TV or the radio as I'm traveling places 
you know, give me a loan note. And you can turn it on or turn it off. But it'll say what the song is. It's playing right now, uh, which is good if you hear a song you want to listen to again. You look at your phone, see what the name of the song is and it's from. Uh, but it's it's a media consumption history, and they they can uh, at some point you can say, remember that movie I watched last week? Who was the who were the actors who starred in that movie? And what are other movies from the same people? Uh, and and that's the power of that type of media consumption history, the ability to do searches like that. Since day one, human beings, since they started fire or building tools. Humanity right. has only been in a quest for more comfort, an easier life, more practical. Um, so all I know is it's not going backwards. We won't go back. <laughs> <laughs> right. The only problem I see is there's a, a big gap. There, there's a lack of an alternative for people who don't want that. They can't so have. We've, we've got very few uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau's who want to go back to Walden Pond, Pond and simplify everything. I remember right. reading that. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, that was during my studies in, uh, in the US, Thoreau. It was uh, very enlightening. And, and you're right. You're right. Uh, but the trend is um, that. The way capitalism works, it's freestyling until DOJ slaps on the table and says, hey, <laughs> party's over, guys. You got to chill. Uh, I don't know what will come out of it. What's very funny is that SEO is still very much under the radar. Like Nobody knows we exist. <laughs> I think more and more people are learning. Of course, but it, it didn't come up uh, to the level of DOJ working one year. Or maybe it did, I don't know. Uh, but we but we see, see the things that uh, Google is replacing. Hmm. I mean, it's replacing yellow pages. It's, it's replacing paper maps. It, it's, replacing, it's replacing newspapers. It's replacing Uncle Joe, who is a car salesman, and you go to because your car is broken, and Uncle Joe might know a garage better than anybody else. You know, so Google is also your—I uh, don't know how in English you say it, but your your qualifying agent, your your recommendation again, word of mouth. You trust Google to. I, I used to every Sunday morning get up and go to a local restaurant and stop in a newsstand along the way and buy a couple of newspapers. I don't do that anymore. Mm. I don't need to. Sure. I've got all the news I want in my phone. Mm -mm. That's also let's let's also finish up on that the predictive search part. Google knows yeah. every Sunday you take that route, you go to newsstand and then go take your coffee and it can predict and serve your stuff before. For example, oh, it, it will rain. Take an umbrella. <laughs> it can't do that. Uh, but uh, or there is a, there's a big accident on the, on the road you usually take. So leave 10 minutes early. Um, this prediction is also maybe um, very useful in certain cases, but we'll still go back to, to this um, huge power and it's back on the table again, like, like 2016. If Google is trying to show good faith, not only Google, Twitter, Facebook, uh, yeah, we're not manipulating anything. We're giving everybody a fair shake, but still, People are finding, <laughs> uh, are criticizing. People are uh, saying no, they, 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 it's flawed, and so on and so on. It's tough uh, on both sides. It's tough, I think. What's your opinion on on the the perception? Because it's so easy to take out a series of bugs or observation, something you notice, and change it into a story 
to fuel a narrative about uh, some conspiracy theory. You know what I mean? So one of the complaints I'm seeing is that Google is putting people in perception bubbles, like mm. mirror uh, bubbles around you that mirror everything uh, the, that's within the center of them. So the things you look for, the things you see in the news on your search results. If, if you have a conservative perspective, you see conservative uh, world results. Uh, if, if you uh, think that there's some type of conspiracy against conservatives, you see conspiracies everywhere. I, I think Google's working to try to bring more diversity to those types of things. When, when they show top stories in the news, they show things that are top stories that may not agree necessarily with your world perspective. They may show alternative quotes or certain social media results that are different than yours on purpose. They're trying to fight that filter bubble type thing. Um, and I agree. It's a problem, but don't you think that people should think twice because it's human behavior, cognitive bias of confirmation. Uh, it's just a tool. People made Facebook. People made Google. When people are looking into something, they uh, put themselves into a, a bubble regardless. So in the digital age, I think it's more powerful, it's faster, it's yeah. stronger, but it's human nature at its, uh, at its best right now. Uh, right. It's, it's not just the uh, search engines is doing that, it's, it's the news channels. If you mm. watch the same news channel night after night, your perspective of the world is uh, biased based on what they're presenting. Uh, Classic case. Same event, you watch CNN and Fox News, you're not watching the same story, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so tech companies, and Google in particular, are in a very difficult spot right now because of the big tech hearing, because of DOJ, uh, because of all those critics, because of privacy. But like I said, technology is not going backwards. It's only moving forward. And human beings are addicted to a more comfortable life, useful stuff, um, and um, where's the balance? I think Bill and I found the right balance. We are nerds. We are professionals of the internet. Uh, we still have a real life. We still we are photographers. We 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 appreciate uh, the outside world, and um, our life is not dictated by uh, notifications and 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 so on. So I think it's up to the individuals to um, to maybe fight. It's not a fight. It's just being reasonable and and being a. Uh, it's common sense. What do you think? About seven or eight months ago, maybe a little bit longer, I uh, was asked to write an article about the biggest SEO myths on the web. And my first impulse in that was, I don't want to write just about what the biggest myths are about SEO. Mm. I want to write a guideline to critical thinking to identify to, to uh, questions to ask when you're when you're uh, looking at something to identify whether or not it's a myth or it's likely true. I wanted people to exercise their ability to think critically, mm -hmm. uh, analyze things, determine whether or not what they're seeing is a good argument if it's supported by uh, reasonable evidence, if it if it actually makes sense or if they're uh, logical fallacies built into what they're seeing for them. Because sometimes you see things that are, sound very realistic, very true on their face, but they're filled with misinformation. Context so, uh, matters. And, and I'm reading a thread on Twitter this morning and somebody called something misinformation 
a bunch of people all started arguing and saying, that's not misinformation, you're wrong. That's disinformation. Mm -hmm. And say so the difference is misinformation is accidentally presenting something that maybe is wrong. This information is purposefully presenting the information to get people to think a different way than maybe they really should based on the information being presented. Mm, interesting. I think there is, there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation on the web. Mm -hmm. I don't think you necessarily need to understand the intent behind misinformation or disinformation, just as long as you realize it's not really good information. I just have a feeling that people blame the messenger a little bit too much. Yes, Google, yes, Facebook, they have their flaws, they are not perfect. Uh, <laughs> but people should investigate. And, and you are the prime example of uh, how even inside an industry with highly skilled professionals, you see the difference between how you approach the same thing. Okay, you want to learn about authorship or uh, author vectors. Um, the way a, a ranking factor study will look at this will say, hey, <laughs> we found that an average of uh, uh, this ratio of well-known authors uh, are present on the first page of Google. So if you become well-known, you have more, more chance to rank higher. The way you look at it is you investigate, you learn the fact, you dig deeper, you profile the author, you do your research, you learn the context, but maybe not it, everybody is able to do that. I don't know. It's, it's easy to blame the messenger. The yeah. herald sometimes is wrong, but if, if they're purposefully presenting wrong information, if you're purposefully listening to them, not insisting that they provide more information, provide facts, support what they're saying, you're just as much to blame as them. Mm -hmm. Totally. No, we agree. And for the final word, the famous SEO is dead meme. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said before, adapt to die. Uh, we say we agree today, search is multimedia, uh, search is everywhere, search People is evolving. People are continuing to search and they're, they're not stopping. Uh, and I will point out that search, our field, our industry is the best of the best out of all the pipelines you can imagine <laughs> to get traffic because of intent. If people search, we have an advantage. If you go disturb them on social media or in their mailbox or, or, or on their phone, like Bill is every morning when we start talking, <laughs> you interrupt when people intent on trying to find a solution to a problem or an answer to a when, question. When I, when, I, when I see somebody talking about SEO and they never mention an audience, no. They never, they never talk about understanding an audience, mm. seeing what the audience says about something, what words they use, what they search for. I, I, I question how much SEO they really know. Uh, I'm also very confused about how people focus just on the product or the service they're trying to sell and not beyond what is really the benefit, what is beyond the product or the service. If, typical example, uh, plastic surgery. I want to remove, uh, I want bigger boobs, okay? Well, why? <laughs> why? Is it, is it you want to please men more? You want to look at yourself in the mirror and like what you see? What? Uh, and and um, trying to go beyond. And the audience is will not tell you sometimes. You have to find out by yourself. You have to investigate and you have to understand what they really want beyond. Uh, we always say benefits, uh, features tell, benefits sell. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, I can't praise you enough, but that's the truth. History tells you are right. You were right from the beginning because what you say right now, and we will end up on this, in 2020, people still 
can figure out what the audience work uh, want. Our job at the end of the day is trying to make the offer and the demand match. Yeah. That's what we do. Trying, there is an offer, there is demand, and how much do they match is the key. And bigger the pie of if we have two circles and those offer and demand, two circles intersect, the bigger the intersection. As, as, as SEOs, we have a website owner at our hands. We can talk to them. We can ask them questions. They're trying to find consumers and turn them into customers. Mm. And that's part of our job. We need to understand those consumers well enough to uh, help them find the website. Mm -hmm. The website owner, the services and goods they provide. And we are in a good state. We we know how it works. We don't use the term keywords, topic, clusters, ideas, concept, whatever you want. Uh, yeah. but, but, but go go a little deeper than 2010 type of SEO. It's 2020. It's time to wake up. And um, I see too many people still stuck in 2010. Uh, honestly, that's... Uh, the rank, the ranking factor studies is a uh, typical of that, but what you just say is also typical. Uh, and I, I feel like, um, like I would say, uh, adopt or die. We'll see. We'll see who is left in five years. I know you'll be there. I'll be there. We'll we're close to retire, but we'll see. Uh, who, we'll see who le who else. One last word of wisdom yes what what can we leave for the ultimate word of wisdom as far as the mindset you need to um how do you say what i say adapt or die what is your polite way to say it <laughs> i don't usually tell people what to adapt or die <laughs> <laughs> It seems kind of fun. <laughs> that's what I say, but um, that's why I, I wanted an advice on how to say it on a more uh, politically correct uh, <laughs> fashion. <laughs> I had a client who had a product that helped people lose weight, and it was a drink. It, it uh, uh, satisfied their appetite. And uh, we wanted to use a keyword phrase that most likely no one in the world would ever search for. Mm. And I had four co-workers around with me. One of them was a strategist. One was a, a, a case manager. And I don't remember what the other two did. But uh, I, I, I said, okay, doctor, chances are most human beings who want to buy your product will never use those words to try to find it on the web. Our job is to help you sell your product. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? Do you have anybody? Do you want to have anybody ever buy it? <laughs> he said yes. I said, think about using words that they search for. I know you like that phrase, and. Scientifically, it's a very good phrase, but most human beings aren't going to use that phrase to find what you're offering. Mm. <laughs> Let's try to get you to succeed. That's what we're here to help you with. It's what you did in 2005 and what you're still doing in 2020. And I right. observed the exact same thing. So like you said, some things never change. Um, and I want to leave a positive note saying that, no, it's not too crowded. No, but it's still, you can still make it. It's, it's not true yeah. that, um, yes, you can't dream like it's 2004 to, to rank easily on super highly competitive keyword, keywords in, in a few weeks. That's, that won't happen. But uh, it's still very new. And... If you work on your difference, if you understand your unique value proposition and you can match offer and demand, you can beat everybody else. 
there are new things happening in SEO all the time. One of them is uh, schema. And there are people who are writing become, have become specialists in schema. Have, who can tell you how best to get a featured snippet? What, what they tend to look like, how they tend to work respectfully. And that's something fairly new. And a lot of SEOs don't understand that. Mm. And you're, you're, there are people who have been doing SEO for a year or two or three. And are really good at understanding schema and getting featured snippets to show up and work really well. Uh, it's possible for people to enter SEO, find a topic like that, become really good at it, and, and do well at it. It's the most valuable advice. Uh, and now we're shifting the conversation and we're ending up talking to SEO professionals who want to start. And that's something that I tell everybody don't become just a 360 SEO, SEM, SMO, X, uh, no, specifics. Become the specialist in schema.org or log analysis or whatever. Go from very specific and then branch out. But people like us, all dinosaurs, we are, we are just SEOs in general today. Uh, no, it's not possible to. I never ever use this line, but I was tempted many times when I'd go to a job interview as an SEO and people would ask me what I know about SEO. And I said, well, I remember the things I invented. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Love it. That's that's something I mean, that I would use. You, you started in 1996 and you invent a lot of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, or at least the first time you saw it was the first time you thought of it. And other people may have started using the same thing, but you were sort of inventing it at that time too. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and we previously used the analogy of, of photography. Because I think when it comes down to it, it's training your eye, training your brain to see what everybody else doesn't see. It's in front of you. Google is telling you everything. It's right there. People can see so it. There, there, there are two ways to become a good photographer. One of them is to take lots of pictures. Two. <laughs> see what works. Another is to look at a lot of pictures mm. and see what you appreciate from them and what you don't like. Exactly. And SEO also works the same way. Look at lots of websites. Work mm. on websites. Exactly. Uh, uh, no, very true. I think that's a good way to end this talk. Um, we still have so much to cover. I feel like it's unfinished business because it's a never-ending story. <laughs> it's it's so, it can be like that forever. <laughs> But, but, but I know that everybody wants you back anyway. They always get feedback that we want Bill, we want Bill. So let me think about it. I'll find something that he can refuse <laughs> and I'll get him back. <laughs> okay, it sounds good. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much for your commitment and your, uh, well, it's natural for you to share so much, but uh, yeah, well, wonderful. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Until next time, thanks for watching.